go to the movies. This is the Cine Realist episode 578. My name is Kyle. My name is James. And my name is Zach. And we're here to talk about movies, movie lists, and movie questions. Movie questions? <laughs> movie <laughs> obsessions? Are, are you going to ask us questions throughout this episode? I, I do. Here's my first question for both of you. Uh-huh. Do you want to be like Mike? No. Michael Jordan? I mean, th- that would be a topical mic to talk about. But it could be the mic we were talking about off air beforehand. No. I want to be like Michael Jordan in some ways, but not in every way, no. In what ways do you want to be like Michael Jordan? I just want I his like money. To have I don't his... want any of the other stuff. <laughs> I would like his basketball ability. Okay, his talent. Not James. James does not want his basketball ability. <laughs> Who needs the ability when you can just have the money part? Well, you could also have fun playing basketball. Yeah. With that much money, you could have fun doing lots of stuff. <laughs> so you actively do not want to be good at basketball. What yeah. a curse. I don't I don't <laughs> need to be bad at it. I just don't need to be Michael Jordan at it. You just I, want someone just to hand you $400 million a year I have for doing no nothing. need to be as famous as the best basketball player ever alive. You know what I mean? I'd much rather just have the money. Than have oh, that I don't want to be the famous money. as Michael Jordan. Well, if you're gonna be, the, <laughs> if you're gonna have the basketball skills of Michael Jordan, then you're going to have the fame of Michael Jordan. No, absolutely not. You're just gonna no, hide like, those skills. Yeah, Zach just, will just um, play pick occasional pickup games, pick up games and crush yeah. all the kids, and just go back to <laughs> editing videos. You won't be playing pickup games very long because nobody will want to play with you. <laughs> That's fine. You're just gonna crush them every time. <laughs> That's Can you fine. imagine I'll Michael a, Jordan going to parks and just destroying I could just coach, people all day? I could just coach my kids' basketball team. You could do that without the skills of Michael eh, Jordan. I bet Michael Jordan would be a better coach than you at, at basketball. I have no I know, doubt. I, I'm you, say that it, you could you have zero skills at basketball and be a kid's coach. Sure, <laughs> I, but I'd be a better kid's coach. <laughs> okay. Sure. Because I have Michael Jordan's <laughs> basketball ability. Yeah, but... <laughs> Wouldn't that make you like frustrated as a coach? We're like, guys, it's simple. All you have to do is these 10 moves and make the basket. And like these little five year olds are like, I, I eh, can't do that, dad. Easy yeah. come, easy go. <laughs> Seems like a waste of a lot of skills just to teach a bunch of kids how That's, to not. So double you would dribble. say, like, hey, would you like to have the basketball ability of Michael Jordan? And you would just say, nah, no, thank you. No, no, no. I would say, give me the money and I don't need that, the skills part. I'm fine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No need. So that's the way I'd like to be like Mike. <laughs> you know, this movie was the first time I realized that Mike and Nike are spelled the same. And no one ever did anything with that. Oh. They're spelled similarly, like, not the same. Yeah, not the same. They got different letters at the beginning. <laughs> A different letter. I don't <laughs> right. know about different letters. So similar, not the same. <laughs> but, but an M and an N are very similar as well. They are. I mean, they're kind of next to each other in the alphabet. Which is weird because you don't call Michael Jordan Mikey. Right. So like they never call? ever did anything with Mike and Nike. Did you guys ever have friends that said Nike as like Nike and like all these other weird pronunciations? No, just Tarjay. Or Nike. Uh, yeah. No. I, I used to have people pronounce it as Nike around me and I'm like. Mm. Those people aren't your friends, James. I mean, if you think of, if you look at the word or the name Mike, I mean it. Kind of makes sense. You just change the first letter to N and it's Nike. But it's not an English <laughs> word. It's a Greek word. I'm just saying. <laughs> I I would know people, especially like coaches, who would say Adidas instead of Adidas. Sure. Which is the technical correct pronunciation in Germany. But but here in the U.S. It's but Adidas. here I'm like, it's Adidas. It's not Adidas. Right. Um, is that just because we started saying it Adidas and so everybody accepted it yeah i mean i i think that's a more uh correct way that americans emphasize syllables than right. adidas same thing with hyundai it's like hyundai or something like that okay but here in the u.s it's hyundai even in the com- even in their commercials it's hyundai you have to anglicize it just to make it more palatable yeah did you know nike was female i did know that I didn't know that. I did yeah. not know that. For the record. Um, welcome to the show. This is episode 578 of the Cinerealist podcast. We appreciate you being here with us. It's 
spending a little time hanging out, <clears throat> talking uh, the brand new movie, Air, drama about uh, the making of the Michael Jordan, Air Jordan tennis shoes, as well as run down our top 10 favorite, quote, basketball, unquote, movies, whatever that means to whoever made the list. Um, we're going to jump into all of that as well as continue the debate on how to pronounce Nike right after, Nike. <laughs> right after we remind you there's a video version of this podcast on YouTube. Go to YouTube, search Cerner Realists, check us out there, subscribe and watch while you listen. You could also support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash Uh, We appreciate your support there. Get extra after show audio uh, with your subscription. You could also leave us an Apple podcast review on Apple Podcasts, five stars only. We appreciate that. Or send us a listener email to heyguys at cinerealist.com, our double E-L with an S on the end. Send a comment, a question, a list suggestion, a movie suggestion, any of those kinds of things uh, or anything you really want to. Just send it to us via email and we will read and discuss it on the podcast on a future episode. Uh, I think it's time to talk basketball shoes. Oh, n- not tennis shoes, James? <laughs> <laughs> no, just basketball shoes. Okay. Solely basketball shoes, which is a statement that's never been said on this podcast, I think. It's time to talk basketball. Was shoes. that an intentional pun? Solely? <laughs> yes. Now that you've brought it to my attention, <laughs> it was intentional. <laughs> Let's get into air right after this clip. I'm willing to bet my career on Michael Jordan. Oh, come on, man. You ask me what I do here. This is what I do. Yeah, I find you players, and I f-ing feel it this time. Yeah, okay, it's risky. When you were selling sneakers out of the back of your Plymouth, that was risky. It took balls. I mean, that's why we're all here. Don't change that now. I mean, if you look at him, if you really look at Jordan, like I did, you're going to see exactly what I see. Which is what? The most competitive guy I have ever seen. He is a killer that was air a movie that's in theaters now it's also a 2023 american biographical sports drama film directed by ben affleck starring ben affleck and matt damon jason bateman marlon wayans chris messina chris tucker and viola davis amongst others the official imdb plot synopsis for air is follows the history of shoe salesman Sonny Vaccaro and how he led Nike or Nike in its pursuit of the greatest athlete in the history of basketball, Michael Jordan. Is the word shoe salesman the proper way to describe his job? Well, he's definitely not a shoe salesman. He's yeah, a shoe like, marketer. I think of Al Bundy no. as being a he's, shoe salesman. He's a recruiter. He's, he's not a shoe marketer. I mean, part of the recruiting is to see is to help marketing. So I don't, I don't know. I I could see recruiter for sure as his job title. I could also see him as just a member of the marketing department and recruiting as part of his job. Yeah, I mean, he definitely he definitely works for the basketball division at mm-hmm. Nike. Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't, I still don't think he, he does spends all of his time though. at high schools. Right, yeah, like he's, he's, scouting he's prospects scouting, too. Scouting talent, yeah, he's yep. a talent scout. Yeah, uh, uh, talent, yeah, sure. Um, so I would change that. But yes, it's so funny. This entire movie is just about signing a business deal <laughs> with Michael Jordan. It's, mm-hmm. This is like Tetris two weeks ago. This whole movie is about getting Tetris to the United States. Yeah, like, yeah, not just like inventing the game, just like. Buying the rights to Tetris in another country. Is that like where we are in movies now? Is we're going to set movies in the 80s about minor business deals? Not minor business deals, but like, like the gritty world of 80s transactions. Yeah, that's yes. where we're at. How, you nailed it. How does it make you guys feel that they are now making period pieces about eras that we were alive? Fine. How does it make I don't care. me feel? That's a good question. I haven't actually thought about that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was fine with it until you asked the question. Okay. 
How dare you? <laughs> now you're making me second guess whether I'm fine with it or not. I mean, they even if they're not making biopics, they literally made a Super Mario Brothers movie. You know what I mean? Like last, that we talked about last week. I know they made one yep. in the 90s, but they actually made one that resembled the game this time. So um, that kind of blows my mind, too. This is like our third 80s based movie in a row. Sure. Yeah. Even though Super Mario Brothers doesn't feel like it, but. No, it but it's based on 80s property. And for so, sure. Right. Yep. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't necessarily have a problem with it. Uh, but it is interesting. Yeah. I, I just found it interesting that, you know, I, I'm used to watching like period pieces from the, like the 50s or 60s and those do the montage of like all the technology like oh that's cool looking technology or isn't that neat and this one has like the 80s montage at the beginning i'm like yeah i remember a lot of this or yeah i mean we've this and- we had like five six years ago a movie about steve jobs and you know that movie ends with him walking on stage to, <laughs> to talk about a mac you know what i mean from that that happened in the early 2000s right so um i think where we've always maybe not always but recently been enamored with history recent history relatively recent history um i also think there's like something that's going around maybe it's always been around and i'm just more attracted to it but with like movies that have low stakes to them right yeah they're nice (laughs) you know what i mean like you know you knew what was going to happen in this movie no matter what you know before you walk in the door you know the ending of what this movie is going to be essentially um and then uh the tetris one too like i was pretty sure nobody got shot during the (laughs) rights negotiations for tetris um and so it's a pretty safe movie to hit play on right um i think basketball movies in general are pretty safe movies to hit play on like the chances of somebody dying during a basketball movie pretty low a movie actually about basketball, not a movie that happens to have basketball. Right. Um, but you'll get a little bit of drama and, you know, th- I guess that's the same for all sports movies, really. But um, what were we talking about? Oh, how does Air. it make me feel that they're making things out of 80s stuff? Uh, I think I'm OK with it. <laughs> um, I am. Um, do you guys remember when I, when I made that list where I took all the movies that I'd seen that were not made in the year that they existed Mm -hmm. yeah right so i I have all that data and i made a bunch of graphs out of that Mm because i was interested to see like is there a sweet spot of nostalgia and based on that data 30 to 40 years is like the period sweet spot for movie nostalgia gotcha so like if the movie came out in the 80s it would be about something in the 40s if it 40s or 50s if it's a period piece correct yes Interesting. Well, I mean, that would make sense since Which, we're in 2023 if they're making things about right. the 80s. Yeah. Where we are now, correct. So, for sure. And I, I feel like in the 90s, we got a lot of movies about the 60s. I mean, it's long enough that like the people who are directing things are probably in their late 30s, 40s, early 50s. And those are people that grew up in the 80s. So, right. Um, makes sense that those are the things that they experienced and so they're making movies about them um yeah i mean this does seem like a very specific moment in time that was significant to one multinational corporation (laughs) and like i don't i i remember air jordans being a thing but i don't remember it being like a movement or anything you know what i mean it was just a popular product in general so I was born in 83, uh-huh. same for Zach. So like we definitely didn't, I don't remember Air Jordans coming out, but like sure. I remember in elementary school, people would talk about Air Jordans and they were pretty significant shoes. Like even in Free Willy, do you remember he gets a pair of Air Jordans? And, and like that was a big deal in that movie and a big deal for that kid. That was probably a brand deal. Oh, sure. yeah, right. Most I'm sure Nike paid to have those shoes in that movie, but I also do believe that Air Jordans were a big thing even in the early 90s. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's, it's still it's a big thing now. It's still it? a big yeah. thing. Yeah. It's arguably a bigger thing now than it was back then as far as like sure. just how many variations there have been and how expensive they are. 
Um, I mean, back then I remember them being like a hundred to one hundred and twenty dollars, and that seemed insanely <laughs> for a, a high pair of shoes. Yeah. For a pair of shoes nowadays, brand new, you can spend three hundred plus on a pair of Air Jordans. Um, and those aren't even like the collectors' ones; those are just day day of release, mass market Air Jordans. Anyway, um, it's crazy how collectible that type of stuff is. But I remember, do you guys remember cross colors in the 90s? No. no. I do, but I can't tell you. Like, I, I remember that phrase, that brand, but I can't tell you much about it. That It was short-lived for sure, but that was like a phenomenon for a while. There was like a six-month period where everybody wore cross colors. And I don't remember Jordan, the brand, ever being like that. I remember it being like, an expensive pair of shoes that rich yep. kids wore, but I don't remember it, you know, just being all over the place. Zach, if you look up a picture of cross colors, you would recognize these for sure. Especially okay. the jackets. Those like those members only style jackets. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Um, and they used to have cross colors used to have shirts where you, they were like one color and then you'd put them on and your body heat would change the color of the shirt. Oh, hypercolor. Yeah. It was pretty wild. Go out yeah. in the Are you sun? guys interested at all to talk about this movie? <laughs> I don't know. You know, I, I'd rather kind of stay in this nostalgia pool for a while. I think the pre-show I- did us dirty. <laughs> <laughs> the pre-show discussion. <laughs> what do you want to talk about when it comes to this movie? Honestly, there's not much to talk about, in my opinion. But if you want to lead the conversation, I'm down. <laughs> well, I would like to know what you guys thought of the movie Air. <laughs> okay. Let's have James go first. We, he always asks us what we think, All right. and he goes last. So let's we'll put James on the spot first year. I mean, I think I saw it three weeks ago, so okay. be merciful on me as far as my memory goes. Um, I would say it's a perfectly nice movie. <laughs> it's very, it's like a nice core movie where like everybody does exactly what you think they're going to do, and... um. They're, they just really want to give this kid a lot of money. <laughs> you know what I mean? And they have a lot of faith in him. And uh, uh, spoiler alert, they do. <laughs> and their faith in them pays off big time. Um, I, I mean, wh- what's there to say about it? There's not much style. I didn't find that there was much style to the movie. It was very plainly told for the mm-hmm. most part. Pretty plainly acted. Like maybe... Ben Affleck was the only one that had like any kind of heightened character to him whatsoever. The the main character that Matt Damon plays is just a pretty boring vanilla dude who's trying to sign a basketball player to a promotional deal. Like there's just not there are no frills to his character whatsoever. No, there's not even complications to his character. He never lies to anybody. He never cheats, steal. There's just no drama well, he, there. He does steal from the food court. He stole from the food court. I don't remember that. No, the, if the cashier is not present, it's not stealing. <laughs> that is how they justify it to themselves. Oh, the food court in the office building owned by right. the company that he yeah. works for. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, he does that with the owner too later on. So is it really stealing? I don't know. Well, it was the first time. Anyway, <laughs> my point is uh, I enjoyed watching it, but I do not think this is special in any way, shape, or form <laughs> compared to things that would be in the same category. And I don't know what would make something in this category special, but this is perfectly fine reciting of probably vaguely how it happened. And that is that somebody made a business deal. Whoopee. <laughs> well, it's, it's not like just with a Tetris, business deal. It's with, a pretty significant business deal, especially when it came to how athletes control their brand and their image. I'm not saying it's a story worth not worth telling. It's just probably more apt as a Netflix movie than a wide release movie with two. I think it was originally intended for streaming, but the reviews, you know, the early response was positive. So they decided to switch to theater. Yeah. And it might sound like I'm not positive on the movie. I am positive on the movie. I enjoyed it, but I will not remember it. I mean, it's, it's, like not memorable i don't think in the long run there's no high scene to it 
You know what I mean? There's no like, will they, won't they type scene or. Yeah, it's just so plainly told and plainly acted. And it's probably very true to how it actually happened. Um, you know, when the spice of your movie is let, that the owner drives a purple Ferrari or whatever it was, Porsche, it's like, okay. <laughs> like, I wonder if that guy did cocaine and stuff like that. Like, can we mix that into the story a little bit? <laughs> I, I do agree that Phil Knight was presented pretty positively. I don't know him. Like, I don't know much about him at all. Right. Sure. But like, like he seemed to be like this pretty perfect character. And even at the end, they were like, he's donating two million, two billion to charity. And Megan's right. like, only two billion? Like, <laughs> that's, that's all. <laughs> like, how much money has he made? So I don't know the history of Phil Knights, but this definitely feels like it was using kid gloves on him as a CEO of a major shoe corporation. Yeah. Um, yeah. Again, I don't have a problem with it, but it's nothing special in my my eyes. What do you guys think of it? Cow? So, yeah, I, I saw this in the theater today, just several hours ago, so I'm still pretty fresh for me. Um, I had a fun time with this movie. And I think for me, what made this movie enjoyable is the ensemble. Because, right, the story is the story of how Air Jordans were created. And correct, we know how it ends up. We know where we're going. But Mm -hmm. that journey, I found to be interesting. Like, not knowing that Nike was not a major player in basketball shoes back when they try and pull this off, like that unknown to me. Um, but again, like I said, for me, it was just the cast, and I really enjoyed this cast. Uh, you know, maybe Matt Damon is the least interesting ca- character of them all, but mm-hmm. I'm always a fan of Jason Bateman. Ben Affleck was doing something which I liked. That guy who was playing the, I don't know, the, the, the shoe, shoe engineer designer. in the basement, like he was a character. I, I could have used a whole movie just on like what his whole background and his whole story was. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, Viola Davis. Great as always. I did read that um Ben Affleck consulted a little bit with Michael Jordan on this. Like I, I I'm curious to know how much did Nike have their hand in this? How much did Michael Jordan have his hand in this? And my impression is Michael Jordan did not have a lot in this. But one of his big asks was Viola Davis must play my mom. Mm-hmm. So I'm glad that Ben Affleck was able to pull that off. And then seeing Chris Tucker, uh, you know, an actor who I saw a ton in like the nineties, early two thousands. It was fun seeing him back on screen too and I always enjoy Chris Tucker. So I think because of the ensemble and because of the no frill story, I I had a good time with this movie. You're right, James. Will it become like the best movie I've ever seen or will I even remember it in five years very well? Probably not, but I'm not mad that I got to spend a couple hours in the theater watching this movie. That's generally where I felt. Zach? Uh, I had a I had a great time with this movie. I thought it was very fun to watch. I wish they made more movies like this where it's low stakes, good vibes, uh <laughs> no characters with huge flaws that you have to, you know, resign yourself to. Mm-hmm. It's just earnest people attempting to do big things earnestly and accomplishing it. And as I think that's a a fun time where everyone's kind of like got each other's back and they're all working towards the same goals. And let's see if we can get this done. And we can. Um, yeah. So I thought it was fun. I was glad there wasn't these big dramatic moments where it hinges on someone being awful or something terrible happening. Right. Mm -hmm. All of the drama came on. Will they accomplish this thing that we know that they will accomplish, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, I liked all of the actors for sure. And I liked all of the acting, except there are some characters doing voices. And I'm, I guarantee you this is because the real actual people they're portraying had a very similar voice to what they're doing, but I found it fairly distracting. Are you talking the shoe designer, the shoe one? designer and Chris Tucker? Hmm. Okay. I've, both of them were like doing like an, an affect. And uh, I'm sure it's a hundred percent what the person in real life sounded like, but <laughs> it just seems so out of place as they're talking. It's just like, okay. It's, it, it just seems zany for no reason. You know, I don't know. 
the, I didn't I, notice I, I, the Chris Tucker one, but I noticed the other guy. The maybe that's what Chris Tucker sounds like now, but he sounded like he's kind of like doing a half accent. I don't know what he was doing. I mean, I, I think Chris Tucker is doesn't have the energy level that he maybe had 20, 30 years ago. So maybe that's why you're like, oh, Chris, Chris Tucker's doing a bit here. And that's just my <laughs> Was that now. Chris Tucker's normal voice or was he doing a voice? Like back are, then or in, or in this no, movie? No, in yeah, the which, movie. In this movie? Yeah. Is that his speaking voice? I would guess he that's his speaking voice. Mimicking yeah. a real person's voice. I, I'm thinking he's just doing that's just him doing okay, his voice. I gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, well, maybe. He, he definitely did like a little code switch moment where how he talked to Michael Jordan's family seemed a little different than how he was talking with like the rest of his corporate peers. Sure. Mm-hmm. But I don't yeah. That that's um, the only thing that stood out to and me. And then was anyone else distracted by Matt Damon's fat suit? <laughs> yeah. I'm like Matt Damon does not have a I mean, it, he it wasn't a huge fat suit, but he doesn't have a gut at all. There's right. no way that guy's gonna I thought it was I just thought it was funny his character because they reference he's out of shape a few times, so they put right. him in like the world's mm-hmm. smallest fat suit. Like just just a little belly punch. Yeah. Yeah. But that was funny. But, you know, everyone carries their weight a little differently, Zach. And we, we shouldn't body shame the <laughs> but designers. That, but he does not carry his weight like that because he again he was wearing a fat suit. He's not <laughs> David. I uh, <laughs> I will say to your point, Zach, there was a moment that felt out of place for me. And that was when Jason Bateman was giving his heart to heart speech to Matt Damon about his daughter and the shoes. And it seemed like they were trying to inject some emotional stakes into this whole thing about how Matt Damon's character was making this huge bet. And it wasn't it was going to affect the company, not just him. And it took a while for me to realize why that speech was in there, but it just felt out of place. That all of a sudden Jason Bateman's character is going from like playing a normal Bateman style character to like this heart to heart speech about my daughter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was also confusing for a while. It eventually cleared itself out. But who was the boss of who? Like it took me a while to realize that um, Ben Affleck was the head boss. He was the CEO. Oh, okay. Until he started telling everyone I'm CEO, I'm CEO. Like where does Jason Bateman fit into the hierarchy? Those were the questions I had for for a little while. Was Bateman like the the president of the basketball shoe division or something? That's the, what yeah. I think he was. Okay, yeah. he was yeah. like in charge of Matt Damon, right? Amongst other but, people in the basketball. But Matt Damon area. seemed to have a close relationship <laughs> with the CEO as well. They seemed to go pretty far back. Yeah, yeah, it's it felt like he like they were had some sort of history where he just walk into his office and yeah. It's I think possible all three of a lot of that is just because those actors are so tied together in real life that we just <laughs> assume they're better friends, you know. No, I mean he he talks to the the CEO like, you know, like they've known each other for a long time. Totally. But I think also um the the Jason Bateman character was in the mix too. It's just like all three of them were people that had worked together for a long time even if technically Matt Damon was below. Yeah. Um Jason Bateman's character um, uh, yeah. two you more guys things are shocked to, to learn that there's a lot of cronyism within corporate America. <laughs> <laughs> two more things I want to say. Okay, is I think that this movie actually had um some bad editing. Yes, I think it was poorly edited. Uh, uh, and some, I th- yep, I think a lot of the writing was was pretty uh, mediocre as well. All right, so you do kind of agree with me that it's plainly made, <laughs> kind of ah. Uh, I would go worse than plainly made. I think that some of the editing and some of the writing was ham-fisted. Interesting. Um, I'll give you some examples. Sure. And Kyle, you were cheering me on with the editing, so maybe you can chime in too. But yeah, there's like there's several scenes I could think of that fit along with this. But one in particular was Matt Damon is driving to um, visit the Jordans, mm-hmm. and uh, there's like a 20 second scene where there's a car in front of him on the road, and he passes the car. And then drives down the road. And absolutely that scene did not need to be in the movie at all. Now, possibly they included it because like there's not a dash of yellow line. There's a solid yellow it's line. A double yellow, so yeah. he, he shouldn't be passing. But that's that shows a little bit of his personality. And the fact that he's like wants to be ahead of this guy, you know, and like get there quick. Perhaps those like visual metaphors are supposed to tell us something about the character. But if you really wanted those in there, that 20 second scene could have been an eight second scene and had more impact. 
instead, it's just this slow, pointless scene <laughs> that I would have taken out completely. Did that stand out to you at all, Kyle? I did notice that moments, and it's so I don't edit. I don't notice editing as much as I think you guys do, just because that is your profession. Um, but that moment for me, I was like, oh, this is they're trying to show how eager he is right now by passing on double yellow. Like it, it felt pretty obvious. So yeah, I, I do just, agree on that. I thought it was hand fisted. And then some of the um writing. So they, <sighs> this is maybe why I forgive it quite a bit. Is some of the worst examples of the writing I actually appreciated quite a bit. So like uh they would just randomly tell us facts about Nike or Adidas <laughs> and stuff. And it was so hammy, you know, it'd be like, hey, did did you know Nike was founded uh, by this? And and the name really means this. And, uh, oh, you know, Adidas, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, it's so, it's so ham fisted. <laughs> but I actually liked hearing those things and I enjoyed that. So I'm fine <laughs> that they're in there. You, you don't like it when characters tell other characters information they should know already. Right, right. It's yeah, so yeah. lazy. But I liked what they had to do. I just think better writing would have like <laughs> made it a little bit more seamless when they did it. Mm -hmm. For me, the I don't know if this is a, a editing moment or a directing moment or what, but it was that scene where um, Matt Damon and Marlon Wayans were talking in a bar. Mm -hmm. And there's a shot where they're using pretty, I guess it's shallow focus, where like they're kind of next to each other. But at one point, one of the characters is in focus and the one like farther down the bar is out of focus. I remember that. And then for a quick second, like the focus switched to the character who wasn't talking and then focused back to the talking character. And it, it, to me, it looked like the autofocus on a camcorder, like wasn't sure which subject to focus on. And like even Megan, who I saw with at, at the end, she was like, did you see that point when the, the focus switched? And I don't know what was happening there because this movie had no other moments of like, weird focus things going on or like handheld camera like this is I, one part and is that I, just like a mistake they left in the movie no i guarantee you the cameras they used did not have autofocus oh no no I, I i'm sure they don't but it seemed like an autofocus thing like when you have an old camcorder and it can't choose which sure. subject to focus on yeah so i think it was intentional okay it just maybe but why didn't work for you yeah <laughs> it, it, it was distracting they yeah. Yeah. not it's not used in movies much anymore but it it was at one point People would do that trick. Like, what do they call it? Change Rack focus, focus between character like between subjects. Oh, totally. That's definitely a thing that people oh, yeah, do. But I'm assuming Matt Damon is supposed to give some sort of reaction when that happened. Okay. I so think just, just, and I think normally it's used a little more subtly than it was in this movie. <laughs> and they were like zoomed way in on people's faces, like super close in during that scene. Yeah. There's also this movie to me felt just a hair too long. Like you mm -hmm. have the moment where spoiler alert, they sh they get the deal, like they get the phone call, which which to me has this hilarious montage of like '80s waiting sets to um, time after time by Cindy Lauper. Like it's raining all the time, and like th this is definitely an intentional choice to like make this montage here. Mm -hmm. Um, they get the phone call, but then there's this new rub about royalties. And I was like, are we in our 20 minutes on the royalty deal? <laughs> or could we like it? I get why like the royalty deal was important because it was groundbreaking, but it kind of seemed like we already hit our, 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 our high peak here. Why are we now going to focus on another 20 minutes on this? See, I like that it, they included that because I, it, it was like this movie's version of a twist. Right. So I, so I, I think it's important. That. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it just felt, it felt like it was, extending the movie longer than it needs to be yeah I'm, i don't know a better way to do it i'm just telling you how i did didn't care for that I you won't. just make the royalties a part of the initial negotiation and then you don't make it a twist at the end <laughs> that's how you would that's how you True. get it in there without it being an after the after the fact type thing i think they're I, trying I, to show like how it. groundbreaking the royalty thing was that, well i liked hmm. it because it showed the mom was like advocating for her son right and uh, it gave me a little something unexpected at the end. I was cool with it. I mean, it's no car chase to the airport through the streets of Russia. But. <laughs> like Tetris. Yeah. I will say I enjoyed this movie a lot more than I enjoyed Tetris. Agreed. Yeah. It, I, I think it's just a fun, easy kind of laid back movie. To me, they are very similar movies. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, no, this one, no, this one is... 
This one might be a little more relaxed, but they're both like pretty low stakes movies about deals. No, this guy's uh, Tetris is filled with bad people, right? Like KGB members. Yeah, and doing bad things to each other. Fatals. And like yeah. you're rooting against people. And this movie, you're not root like you're rooting for everybody on screen. That, I was reading a very as, different vibe. I was reading as Adidas. <laughs> I thought it was a super different vibe. I don't know. I thought I, I thought I, they're, I'm not going to say they're the same, but I do think they're swimming in the same waters. If anything, Tetris had more uh, had an interesting, a more interesting way of presenting itself than this did to me. Like the most interesting thing about this movie was the fact that the people that were in it are in it. <laughs> Because it really does not feel like a story that um, big Hollywood A-listers sign up for. And yet they did. That's great. I mean, I don't have a problem with it or anything. I know it's the first movie that Ben Affleck and Matt Damon have made under their own studio label. And so I think um, I think oh. maybe it would have been somebody else other than them if it wasn't like they wanted to guarantee that the first movie the studio made was like something that's, you know, got a chance, Mm -hmm. I would say. Um, And, you know, having them in a movie does say something on some level, especially with Ben Affleck directing it. It's definitely like the most low key movie he's directed so far. Yeah, probably. What else is he directed? Like, if you saw this movie and didn't know Argo, Ben Affleck directed Argo, it, that's right. yeah. you, wouldn't town. Know, you wouldn't know he directed it by watching it. I agree. I agree. It doesn't have any directorial stamp on it. Right. So. Should have Remember the Kevin scene Smith where, like, Ben Affleck went for a run? At uh, the very end? I, no. Oh, no. Ben no. Affleck. Yes, yeah, I do. I would have yeah. taken that out as well. <laughs> <laughs> See, to me, that was the only color the movie had. Him going for a run? Yeah, it was like funny to watch him walk around in like, you know, short shorts and stuff like that. But that that's how dry the movie is. Like that was more interesting than what was going on in the movie so far was watching Ben Affleck run around in 80s gear. I don't know. I liked all the stuff of like he he tells him this is what the meeting with Adidas is going to be like. This is what the meeting. Yeah, that was cool. With, with, you know, and then you see those meetings. I thought all that was fun. I thought. I definitely got a sense of the shoe companies of that era and mm-hmm. which before I had none of that. Yeah. I liked that part too, but there's an hour and a half more here that, uh, surrounded that <laughs> that's unaccounted for. <laughs> yeah. All right. So let's <laughs> letterbox this bad boy. I don't even have a problem with the movie itself. It's more like, is this a story that needs to be told in a two hour movie? I don't know. I don't think it needs to be told, but it's maybe not, a, maybe it an ESPN 30, 30. That's like 45 minutes to 55 minutes. I think you could got, you could have gotten the gist of what's going on here. Without. So you just wanted I, the dry documentary. <laughs> I mean, I guess instead I, I got a dry movie. I didn't feel like I wasted my time because I enjoyed my time. Sure. So I'm not mad at it for that reason. I enjoyed my time. Yeah, I wasn't mad at it either. Again, it's a nice score movie. It's uh, supposed to not, you know, it's supposed to be liked, <laughs> not yeah. loved. It's never, it's never going to have enough edge to it to be loved. But yeah, like, do you think, I think it does. That. Do you think um, 10 years from now, mm-hmm. there will be more than 30 people in the world where this is their favorite movie of all time? More than 30? Yes, so I do think. Spe- that is so specific. I think yes. <laughs> you think yes? Yeah. James? That, uh, and 10 years the, from now. This is the, the movie they profess as their favorite movie. Yes. If someone yeah. asked, what's your favorite movie? They would say this movie. In a world where we couldn't actually calculate somebody's favorite movie, 30 right, people right. are claiming this as their favorite yes, movie. Yes, in 2033. Um, 30? This is more. Sure, 30, why not? You yeah. think so? I think I so. Don't know. Cool. I, th- Good for I it. think because it's about shoes, especially specifically Air Jordans, which are, as we said, very popular, starring popular actors who will still be popular in 10 years. And it's a pretty easy to digest movie. 
yes, I think in 10 years, there'll be at least 30, if not more people who say this is their favorite movie ever. That's great. <laughs> Here's a question. <laughs> yeah. On I'm Letterboxd, sorry, James. I asked the questions this episode. <laughs> on Letterboxd, how many people are a fan of Air? Don't look it up. Yeah. Oh. Well, uh, okay. Can, can you tell me? Can you tell me how many checks it has? Like at least how many ratings does it have? How many ratings? It yes. has sixty-nine k. Sixty-nine thousand ratings. Sixty-nine thousand. And just to remind you, a fan is somebody who has put it in their top four. Their top four. Yep. Um, I'm gonna say right now it has. 200 fans zach i guess 13 zach guess 13 kyle guessed 200 the actual answer 231 nice nice so kyle was definitely closer what do you think the average rating on letterboxd is 3.3 okay kyle says 3.3 zach looked it's a 3.8 oh okay that's that's really high to be honest that- it's it's because it's in this first weekend. Give it give it a couple of weeks. Give it a couple of weeks for the haters to come out. No, it'll it'll go up. Wait, wait it'll the go up. Go you think this. it'll get oh, yeah. up into the no. fours? <laughs> no, it will not get up to the fours. No, it'll come down. Yeah, I think it'll come down. But I I, I don't think it'll go below three. I bet you'll come down to maybe three point four is its floor. Yeah. <laughs> so well, one review called it a gentleman six out of ten. I like that. A gentleman six. The most liked review for this on Letterboxd is Ben knows what the people want. Movies about Matt Damon being good at his job. <laughs> Pretty much yeah. exactly how I would describe this movie. Um, I, I, I will say one of maybe my favorite things of all time in movies based on real events is showing pictures in the end credits yeah. of the actual <laughs> real people involved. <laughs> Sure. And bonus points if it's like from the same events depicted in the movie. I I eat that up. Did they do like, side by sides in this one or just the original person? Um, they did I the original, not side just by the sides. original, but of things that were memorable enough from the movie that you instantly connected the dots. Mm-hmm. Like they had a photo of the Jordan family by the banner that says "Welcome Jordan Family." Yeah, which I thought was pretty cool. And they had mm-hmm. the CEO with his like bare feet on the desk. Yep. Mm-hmm. Evidently, that was a thing he actually did. Right. Which is ironic for a shoe company CEO. That you wouldn't well, put your kick your shoes up on the desk? That he doesn't wear shoes. Well, well no, he, he was wearing Nikes through most of the movie. There was like yeah. that one scene where he had his, his feet up on the desk. Right. But every other time he was wearing a suit with Nikes. You know, yeah. I get that. Yeah. I'm just saying... He's wearing shoes less than most characters in most movies, <laughs> and he is a shoe CEO. Yeah, but I, I mean, Matt Damon's wearing loafers. Like, I would say he probably wore <laughs> Nikes more than any other character wore Nikes at all. Like, Michael Jordan even wore Nikes in this movie. <laughs> but Michael Jordan was arguably not in this movie. <laughs> uh, so, that I, what do you guys think about that? How there was a Michael Jordan shaped body that was kind of I floating throughout that this decision. movie. You what? I support that. I support that decision. Yeah, because like it's it's as much as it's about him, like you realize how much this is not his decision whatsoever. Yeah. And it's about like these bigger players, including his 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 mom who are making this decision. Plus, he's so recognizable. I was fine with it. I, I think they could have found somebody, though, who could have played young Jordan and it'd be fine. I mean, they made they made a movie with, you know. Straight out of Compton has very recognizable people in it. We accepted those people as well, actors who played people we were very aware of. They hired Ice Cube's son to play him. <laughs> like, <laughs> right, but Dr. Dre, you know what I mean? There, there were other people in that movie other than Ice Cube's son. And even Ice Cube's son, like, he doesn't look exactly like Ice Cube. He looks uh, He looks sort pretty of dark. Like, clo- like you, you, <laughs> I'd say about 50%. That's what yeah. I'm saying. Like, you can find, especially when somebody's younger, you can find people that look generally like them and then and, and suspend in their immediate family. <laughs> make the movie good enough that people will suspend disbelief. I think they could have. I'm not saying they did wrong by not doing that. I will say that at times it felt like they were being a little clever with it. And that annoyed me more than the fact that they weren't showing a Michael Jordan. 
where, where, where like he would you would um, someone would be talking to Michael Jordan and he should be facing the character, but like another character would be standing right in front of him so you couldn't see his face. I, I don't know. It and just, then he like turned. I, I don't know. He was he was always in profile or like obscured in the background. Yeah, at times I was just kind of like, okay, just get him out of the shot if you're gonna <laughs> tease us. It's like the awesome powers joke with the fruits of like how can we hide yeah. things with fruit? The whole I liked time. it. It's exactly yeah, like it. that. I think that's what they had in mind when they blocked shots throughout this movie. <laughs> the Austin Power, Powers fruit gag. Actually, I heard an interview with Ben Affleck and he mentioned that. Yep. I think so. He that did. and the Viola Davis thing. Yeah. Yep. Um, anything else on air? I feel like we've talked about this way more than the movie deserves. <laughs> Yeah, you hate this movie, James. I don't hate it. It's just, it's absolutely a streaming movie that should come and go and nobody should really give a lot of I think to. I'm more likely to watch this movie again than Straight Outta Compton. Oh, no way. I'd watch Straight Outta Compton again any day over this. How many times have you watched Straight Outta Compton? Twice. Okay. Once in the theater, once on 4K. And Kyle's zero, so that's an average of one. You never seen Straight Outta Compton? I've never seen Straight Outta Compton. You would absolutely enjoy Straight Outta oh, Compton. No, what's my barrier? My barrier to entry is it's mm-hmm. like nearly three hour runtime. Really, I don't remember it being that long. Do you? Oh, well, that's is good. That, okay, that's good to hear. But maybe yeah, that's it, like the uncut version or something. <laughs> Do you remember you it being that remix? long, Zach? I don't remember how long it was. Yeah. Um. How much of the straight out of Compton story, the NWA story, do you know, Kyle? Decent a fair amount. amount. I, I listened to a lot of NWA in college and okay. immersed myself in their history. Well, then um, not much that happens as far as historical high points will be surprising to you, but it's a mm-hmm. fun like 90s gangster rap vibe to the whole thing. Oh, yeah, thing. no, I, I definitely, I want to see it. I just need to make the effort to see it. Sure. Cool. All right, let's letterbox this. Let's do this. Let's do it. I gave it a three. I gave it a three and a half. <laughs> I give it a three and a half. Nice. <laughs> Why are you laughing? It's just so funny. Our 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 reviews felt very different, <laughs> but only half star different on the scale. <laughs> I don't know. Sure. Zach, I feel like you and I run the same vibe with this movie. No, no, I mean James, James and oh, us. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. I, I've I've come to learn with James if he was like this movie's fine and blah 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 da, 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 three stars like I I just I just know the the, the tenor of how those are, those reviews are gonna go sure Kyle's I guess got I would have thought that's a two and a half for James like just like nothing two and a half is like middle completely of the road. average gave you exactly what I expected yeah if you took um if you took Matt Damon if you took the cast out of this and like replaced them with less charismatic people it'd been a two and a half. You know, half star bump for way over um, overcasting <laughs> this movie that does not need this caliber of stars in it for sure. It's the kind of movie that, like, if Ben Affleck and Matt Damon weren't making it together, one of them might have been in it. The only reason they're both in it is because they're both producers on it and they're, you know what I mean? Like, they're invested he- heavier than just being in a movie. If this um, movie was not being made by Ben Affleck, he would not have been in this movie. The film night would have been a different character. A hundred. A different actor. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. This would have been a Matt Damon movie. Yeah. There's nothing about it. the characters or the writing on the page that tells me these guys picked up a script and said, I got to make this movie. <laughs> they said, hey, what do you think would be commercially viable? That would be fun to make. Well, nobody's done the Michael Jordan story. Can we get the rights to that? Yep. Well, let's go talk to Michael Jordan. Before you know it, they're making a movie. And they're like, well, who wants to be the Matt Damon character? Well, you might be better at it than I will. Okay. That's probably how they picked who gets to be the agent. You know what I mean? (laughs) Would not shock me if that's how it went down. (laughs) But yeah, three. One, three. Two three and a halves for air. Um, air is a movie that's like tangentially related to basketball. And so we decided that um, we were going to make a list of uh, basketball movies. So I guess it's time. Let's rank some movies. Let's rank some movies. Rank some Let's. movies. 
Let's do it. Um, yeah, this is our list of top 10 basketball movies. Why don't I go first? Before I start, I'll define how I ranked and came to this list. This list is what I consider basketball movies, meaning movies that certainly have basketball in it. And they're kind of ranked by how much I like them and also how much basketball is in them. So there's some movies that I certainly prefer as a movie in general that are lower on this list, but that's only because they're not really about basketball. It just happens to have basketball in it, like a decently significant amount of basketball. So, um, and then my number one has, uh, like, not only do I really like it, as a general movie, but it also has a lot of basketball in it. So okay. my number 10 is basketball from 1998. This is the uh, comedy starring Matt stone and Trey Parker, AKA the South park guys. Um, this is a crass late nineties comedy, about two guys who um, are tired of not being able to compete with, other athletic people of the same age. And so they invent a sport that anybody can be good at, even if you're unathletic. And then this sport just happens to grow to be so popular that a pro version of it happens <laughs> and they become rich and famous. And uh, the movie is very silly. I haven't seen it in a long time. I'm sure there's lots of jokes in it that I would cringe at nowadays. Uh, but my memory of it was that it was pretty funny. And it has uh, a little bit to do with basketball. And that's why it's my number 10. Nice. Uh, okay, my list. Um, I actually found it difficult to make a top 10 list for basketball <laughs> movies. I had certainly seen enough movies that had basketball in them. Mm -hmm. But not enough movies that I would consider basketball movies. Um, but my number 10 it has a basketball element and it's bedazzled uh in one of his iterations he plays a basketball player and it's not my favorite part of the movie but it's there and it's a movie that i enjoy and it's my number 10 i also had trouble making this list um i do not watch a lot of basketball movies nor do i rate them very highly James, you sent us a list of like basketball in movies. So I took that list. I took the 10 movies that I can remember the most about having some sort of element of basketball in them. Mm -hmm. And then I ranked those movies twice. I ranked them first by how much I liked them. And mm -hmm. then I ranked them again by how much basketball is important to that movie. And then took those two rankings and kind of made a, a, a master list, which is this list right here. So very, very similar to yours. So okay. um, there are definitely movies on this list I do not like, but they are definitely <laughs> basketball lists, movies, and they may actually be higher than movies I actually do like because they have to fit both criteria. Because they so, have a lot of basketball in them. They have a lot of basketball. So this is definitely a list of 10 basketball-related movies. Ranking is a little strange, though. Yeah, basketball movies. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, I, I think six of these movies were from the 90s. And I don't know if the 90s was a sweet spot for basketball movies. Or just that was the era I was actually watching sports movies being a kid. Mm -hmm. But I just found that to be interesting. So my number 10 is Father of the Bride from 1991. Uh, this movie stars Steve Martin and Diane Keaton. And it is about um, Steve Martin's daughter getting engaged and growing up in him dealing with having to plan this elaborate wedding for his, his sweet daughter. Um, I saw this movie for the first time a couple months ago. I'd never seen it. And Megan suggested we watch it. She watched it a lot. And this is a a nice, light 90s comedy. And I miss that era of movies where you can like make something silly. It's kind of forgettable, but it's kind of fun at the same time. And Steve Martin and his daughter bond over playing basketball in the backyard. Hence the basketball elements to a fun 90s watch. <laughs> Sure. Not all I, this movie aged very well, but I still had a good time with it. I don't remember much about Father of the Bride. And I definitely don't remember the basketball scenes. <laughs> that's <laughs> I don't remember that at all. Well, that's why it's a number 10 on my list. <laughs> nice. 
<laughs> awesome. Uh, back to me. Back to you. All right. My number nine is from 1986. It's the classic Hoosiers, which is like one of the most famous basketball movies, I would say. Um, I watched it maybe, I don't know, five, ten years ago. And uh, I don't, I, you know, it's fine. I don't know why people love it so much, to be honest. I, I don't fully understand why this is considered like the basketball movie. Um, but uh, it's not bad. This, you know, stars Dennis Hopper as like a guy who, or Gene Hackman as a guy who is coaching a basketball team. And it's like set in the fifties, I believe. And he um, is just a, like a really harsh dude and kind of tough love type stuff. And they're like a nearing the championship game and people in the town like that they're winning, but also don't like that he's mean or I don't know. There's just a bunch of drama for drama's sake. And it's just, uh, I don't know. it's supposedly based on a true story. So maybe all of this is like very true to how it actually happened, but um, it's fine. And, you know, I didn't get it, but I didn't have a problem with it either. My number nine. Uh, my number nine is uncut gems. It's the Adam Sandler movie that came out relatively recently. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean the, the, the whole, there's a whole set piece at the end where, where an NBA game is taking place and he's betting. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, this movie is kind of an, an anxiety dream, but it's, it's well-made and I enjoyed it. Nice. My number nine is Pleasantville from 1999. The stars Tobey Maguire and Reese Witherspoon as two teenagers in the 90s who get sucked into a 1950s sitcom called Pleasantville. Mm -hmm. And they start to, it was a black and white sitcom. Um, and then they, their 90s sensibilities start bringing color and joy into this black and white world that they are living in. Uh, it's a fun movie. Um, it's got some good performances and there is a basketball team in Pleasantville. I remember they're shown um, all making like perfect free throws together. And then as the world gets more colorful and less perfect, the basketball team actually gets worse throughout the movie. It's another one I, I need to about revisit. That. Yeah. I don't know if I need to revisit this movie, but I remember liking it <laughs> when I saw it. Which was when? Probably 1998 when it came out. That's when I saw it too. That's okay. Why, that's why I feel like I need to revisit it because I know people who really like Welcome to Pleasantville and I don't remember it enough to know whether I really like it or not. <laughs> Maybe if we do a Reese Witherspoon list. Oh, wait. What? We did, did we do that? a Reese Witherspoon list already? I don't know. Did we? No, we were we going talked to. about it. Yeah. But instead, we, yeah, we, okay, we haven't done one yet. So we need to do a Reese Witherspoon list, and that's your excuse to re rewatch Pleasantville. Great. She releases movies at a fevered pace. So any day now, we'll get a Reese Witherspoon list. My number eight is The Basketball Diaries from 1995. You're right. A lot of 90s movies in this list for sure. Um, this one definitely has basketball in it. Uh, and throughout it, but it's not like you assume like basketball diary is about like a kid who like makes it to the NBA or something and he keeps it. He tracks his progress in a diary. It's not about that at all. It's about a kid who like likes basketball, but has a messed up home life. And um, eventually one of his friends dies of uh, like cancer or something like that. And he gets really depressed and starts using heroin and comes drug addicted and he's never really even that good at basketball <laughs> but for some reason him and his friends are like constantly hanging out at basketball courts and stuff like that over the course of his young life as depicted in the movie um the main character is leonardo dicaprio there's also a really young marky mark in this movie mark Wahlberg. um juliette lewis is in this movie because it's a 90s movie and she was in all of them and um yeah it's good, especially if you like pre-Titanic Leonardo DiCaprio. This is in that zone for sure. I like it. My number eight. 
Uh, my number eight is a 90s movie uh, called <laughs> Flubber. Flubber. Star- yeah. Mm-hmm. Flubber stars Robin Williams. I remember the basketball scenes from that movie. Yeah, absolutely. He is an absent-minded professor who uh, discovers a green goo that uh, gains energy the more it is it uses energy, right? And so one of the um, hijinks that he does is he puts it on the soles of the basketball player's shoes so that they're super bouncy uh, so they can win the big game. And uh, nice. this is, you know, just uh, just a movie that came out right at the right time for me as a kid that I just loved it at the time. I've seen it since. It, it's lost some of its charm with age. But... Uh, yeah, it's Robin Williams just being a goofy professor who invents a goofy um, lover. And uh, I liked it. And it's my number eight. What year did Flubber come out? 97. 97. Okay. So we were 14. See, that's that's interesting that this that you liked this movie. Because I remember like having having to take my brother to this movie. <laughs> Even and though we didn't like it. I didn't. I didn't like it as much. I, yeah, I. I think in '97 I was ready for like rated R movies. And, you know, <laughs> gotcha. And this is the movie I, I take my brother to. I remember the whole ad campaign for this. It had like the flubber dancing around. Mm-hmm. Yep, I do remember that. The and it was like cool graphics yeah. back then. It was. Yeah, probably done by Pixar. Pixar did. All, do you know Pixar did all the like Listerine ads? Oh yeah. Oh okay. really? Mm-hmm. Pretty much any cool computer animated anything. They did yeah. in the it's late 80s song. and 90s. Um, but yeah, I remember one of the ads had a song, you know, it was like, um, do a little dance. Um, mm-hmm. Make a little love. Yeah, but it was, uh, goo, it was goo a little dance, make a little flub. Get down flubber. tonight. Yeah. <laughs> I did not know Zach was such a flubber super fan. Yeah, flub it was down an effect- tonight or something like that. <laughs> it, was, it was an effective <laughs> ad campaign. Nice. My number eight. All right. Uh, my number eight is a movie from the 80s called Teen Wolf. This stars Michael J. Fox as a teenager in high school who discovers that he is a werewolf. He actually comes from a family of werewolves. And once he comes to terms with the fact that he's a werewolf, he uses his werewolf powers to be an amazing basketball player doing flips and slam dunks when he's not surfing on the top of a van. Uh, this is a very 80s movie. Um, I'm pretty sure if Michael J. Fox had not landed Back to the Future the exact same year, he probably would be known for this movie and whatever sitcom he was on before that, and that was it. But thankfully for his career, he was able to get out of the Teen Wolf vein and uh, launch off of Back to the Future. And interestingly enough, Teen Wolf 2 stars Jason Bateman. Yep. Um. Have, did you guys see that uh, the trailer for the Michael J. Fox documentary? No. Looks good. Forget who's putting it out. Maybe Apple Plus. But there's like a whole two hour documentary about him. And it's like supposedly goes through the first part of his career. And then the back half is like him still continuing to work, even though he has pretty debilitating Parkinson's at this point. Um, and like what the motivation behind all that is. Mm-hmm. It looks interesting. I'd watch that. The final shot phrase, whatever of the documentary gave me chills. It was good. It looks like a feel good thing, Zach. I think you'll be into it. My number I, seven is champions, which came out this year. And uh, I watched it in preparation for this list, and I ended up liking it quite a bit. I was charmed by it. This movie stars Woody Harrelson, Caitlin Olson, Ernie Hudson, and Cheech Marin. And uh, a supporting cast of um, intellectually disabled youth, I would say. Um, It's directed by Bobby Ferrelli one half of the Frelly brothers who have done a bunch of comedies that I've enjoyed. And uh, in this movie, Woody Harrelson is a basketball coach who um, gets fired from his, you know, junior college basketball 
coaching job. And then the same night he gets a DUI and the judge sentences him to 90 days of coaching this team of special Olympics basketball players. And so he, he of course doesn't really want to do it actually in this movie. He does. It's, it's not even that he doesn't want to do it. He's fine with doing it. He just doesn't, uh, you know, it's like a part of his punishment type of thing. And then once he gets there, he kind of is charmed by these guys <laughs> as players and like how um, earnest they are and how much they want to learn and how much they, um, you know, kind of live in their own world in a, like an innocent kind of way. Um, and he kind of lets go of his professional frustrations with the game of basketball um, as well as kind of learn something about himself. And there's a romantic interest that is woven through this movie. And um, I just, I enjoyed it. There's like some off color jokes, but they're mostly told by the players themselves. And most of the cast is like very funny, but not in like a laugh at kind of way, just in the, like a, I don't know. They just, the funny guys funny personalities (laughs) yeah funny personalities and um you know uh people that will um say things that are inappropriate but can get away with it if that makes any sense you know what i mean like they're just you you know none of it's in um none of it's said in a spiteful way i don't know I don't know what I'm saying really, but, um, if you want another nice core movie, this is definitely that like nothing bad is going to happen in this movie. Basically only good things for pretty much all, even when things go bad, it's all good in the end. Um, and, uh, and it was fun to see Woody Harrelson play just kind of a nice guy who messed up, who, you know, is trying to figure out what his next steps are. Um, and that's generally how the movie portrays him, but I enjoyed my time with champions and that's why it made my list. My number seven. Cool. Uh, my number seven is space jam. Uh, that is a basketball movie with Michael Jordan Mm -hmm. and the Looney tunes. And I think it's a lot of fun. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's got the whole gang. (laughs) And they're interacting. And I I do like movies that have real people and cartoons interacting. I think that's fun. So mm-hmm. Space Jam has my full support. I haven't seen the new Space Jam. But Stay I don't really tuned. care. When's the last time you saw the old Space Jam? Maybe five years ago. Oh, it wasn't that long ago. Did we watch it for something? Hmm. I don't know. I don't know either. I can't imagine right. why you'd watch it unless you were forced well, to. I've never seen it. Oh, okay. That was the first watch. It's probably on My... the BFI top 100 list, so <laughs> you had to check it off. Okay. Go ahead, Kyle. All right. <laughs> My number seven, another 90s movie I saw as a kid is The Air Up There. This is a Kevin Bacon movie where he plays a college basketball coach who spots like on a tape this incredible basketball player in Africa. I believe Kenya is the country and then travels to Africa, Kenya to recruit this um, young man to play on his team and then has to then coach their local basketball team to, I don't know, stop colonialism or something like that i'm not exactly sure how the actual plot of it um this is a movie again i haven't seen since it came out but i whenever i think about basketball movies this movie comes into my brain as it's definitely a basketball movie um i watched the trailer today and i am sure this movie has aged very poorly there's a lot of kevin bacon wearing like i don't know stereotypical african war paints and cheering on you know his coat his players and i'm sure there are some Jokes that seemed very funny in the uh, 1990s about a white guy in Africa, which probably do not hold up anymore today. But when I think basketball movies, this is one of the first movies that always pops into my mind. Hence why I got to stick on this list at number seven. It was it's a comedy. Yes. Yeah. It, it's it's kind of like a Mighty's Duckish or yeah, sort of hmm. movie. All right. 
I assumed that Emilio, I always thought Emilio Estevez was in this movie. I was surprised to see it was Kevin Bacon <laughs> as I was researching it today. Yeah, I can't think of too many Kevin Bacon comedies. So I'm curious. It's like a Disney family comedy. I don't know. I don't, mm-hmm. don't know if Disney actually produced it or not. Hollywood mm-hmm. Pictures. So it's not Disney, but it feels like a Disney style movie. Hollywood Pictures was technically Disney, I believe. Was it? Pretty sure they owned Hollywood Pictures. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I always think about um, Touchstone as being Disney's other big studio. Maybe I'm thinking of Hollywood Records. Possibly. I don't know. Did Disney put out The Rock as well as G.I. Jane? I mean, that's what it's like one of their labels where you didn't know it was Disney, but it was technically Disney. Yeah. Michael Eisner founded Hollywood Pictures. Okay. Well, there you go. So this is a Disney adjacent movie. It was uh, founded and owned by the Walt Disney Company in 1989. Does that sound about right? Yeah, I mean, like looking at their most popular movies, they're definitely things from the 90s and 2000s. So 89 makes sense. Yeah. And they're like things that they didn't necessarily want the Disney name attached to. Right. I guess I, I thought that's why, why they had Touchstone. That was supposed to be their yeah. non-Disney Disney wing. They made Dangerous they Minds. Yep. So they, Joy Luck Club. They couldn't put Disney's Dangerous Minds out, so they <laughs> had to put it out under Hollywood pictures <laughs> arachnophobia that couldn't be a, a disney movie too scary um my number six is coach carter from 2005 uh this stars um samuel jackson and channing tatum's in the movie as well um and it's about a basketball coach who is teaching um He's not teaching. He's coaching a basketball team in a high school. And the team is pretty good, but they're not very good students. And so he literally benches like almost the entire team and tells them if they don't get their grades up, then they're not going to play, which means the team's not going to win the championship. And um, they're like, you can't do that. And he's like, I just did it. And then the Hmm. rest of the movie plays (laughs) and he holds true. Like he basically keeps star basketball players who would probably get college, you know, whatever scholarships and stuff like that. And maybe play someday in the NBA. He's like benching them because they can't pass their classes in high school. And so, um, he's getting all kinds of pressure from the administration and from parents to like ease up and like help find a way. And he's like, the way is you get your son to study (laughs) because I, I care more about the kids than I do winning a championship, basically. Um, and uh, it's good. Based on a true story. It's a good, good basketball movie. Produced by MTV. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's this whole like micro genre of like person in authority applies tough love. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, it's, it's a good formula, right? Like those movies are always inspiring i guess to watch i don't know sure i mean there are shades there's coach carter and then there's um oh what's that movie about the teacher that literally beats his students with a baseball bat? stand and deliver (laughs) yeah stand and deliver (laughs) like that is a very different he beats his students with a baseball bat i mean it's a pretty violent movie yeah i don't remember (laughs) i I thought he beat them with poetry i i no i mean the whole thing was he walked around the school with a baseball bat that's not sand deliver. That's like the substitute or something like that. Yeah, I, I don't. Or remember. the principal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's tough love, right. and then there's borderline horror movie. Go ahead. My number six is Love and Basketball from 2000. Um, this is a basketball romance, and um, I uh, I I really like this movie. I had a I had a friend that I worked with that loved this movie. There was This was their favorite movie, and they would watch it all the time. And mm-hmm. so I always think of them when I think of this movie, but I like that it can inspire that kind of love. Uh, it's Yeah, it's good. It's, it follows a, um, a couple that have known each other their whole life, and they're both really into basketball. 
and you kind of see the trajectories of both of their like basketball career basically and their trajectory of their relationship together and it's good it's like a romantic fun movie with a lot of basketball in it and i liked it so love and basketball from 2000 nice my number six is space jam colon a new legacy uh, I had not seen either Space Jam movie before, and I figured I should watch one for this list. And so I asked my son, because they're both streaming, which one do you want to watch? And he chose Space Jam, A New Legacy, because he knows who LeBron James is and does not know who Michael Jordan is. So we watched this movie, and I did not care for it. <laughs> but it's very basketball-y, so here it is. Um, in this movie, LeBron James is sucked into the Warner server at Warner Brothers. He and his family are by an algorithm played by Don Cheadle and is forced to play a basketball game against his movie son. He has a real family, but his actual family aren't playing themselves. He has to play a basketball game against his movie son to, I don't know, keep the server from being deleted or something silly like that. <laughs> Um, so LeBron James travels the server verse with Bugs Bunny trying to get all the other Looney Tunes characters back together to play another game. Uh, and this is definitely like corporate synergy at its finest, where this whole movie is just references to other Warner Brothers um, properties, mm -hmm. which is kind of interesting when Bugs Bunny and LeBron James are traveling from like Warner Brothers movie to Warner Brothers movie to find different um characters like for one they go to the actual movie the matrix and it's that scene with trinity at the very beginning where she's in the room with a telephone but instead it's like the the cartoon granny is trinity and it's that whole sequence just with cartoon granny doing all the trinity moves hmm. and like as soulless as that was it was actually kind of like funny just to watch the matrix with cartoons in it and my son was like is this the matrix and he was just having a hoops that he could watch even a little clip a little bit of the matrix um, where guns were actually being fired he thought that was the, the, the craziest thing sure um but then like the basketball game is fine lebron james can't act his way out of a paper bag the story <laughs> is silly uh however my absolute favorite part of this movie is the the bad guy don Cheadle, fills the stands with like all of these famous characters from the Warner Brothers universe, but they're not being played by like the actual actors. They're just like extras dressed up like them. Mm -hmm. So you have like this extra dressed up like Batman next to this extra dressed up like Pennywise next to a bunch of the Droogs from Clockwork Orange. And this is a kid's movie, by the mm -hmm. way. And they're all like, look like B-level cosplayers <laughs> cheering on this game in the background. And it's so distractingly wonderful to see, like, crappy Pennywise behind Don Cheadle. <laughs> I don't know. Like, it, it's it's worth it almost to watch those basketball scenes just to, like, pick out these crazy extras in cosplay behind them. Hmm. I found that way more interesting than whenever basketball was happening on screen. <laughs> I haven't seen it yet, but I'm... I, uh... I don't know. I don't know what would motivate me to see that movie. <laughs> I think you could see it if you want to see like Looney Tunes characters in Casablanca. Mm -hmm. That happens. And extras in bad costumes. Sure. I don't particularly like the first of the Space Jam. So I don't know. What like what's the. How similar to the first Space Jam is it? Well, I've never seen the first Space Jam. Oh, okay. So I can't tell you. I don't know, Zach, how similar does that sound to your Space Jam? Not too similar. Yeah. I, it, it it really felt like this whole Warnerverse thing they were really trying to push forward. Mm -hmm. All right. My number five is from 1994. This is Blue Chips, which is a definitely a basketball movie. Uh, starring Nick Nolte, Nick Nolte, Mary McDonald, Ed O'Neill. Shaquille O'Neal and Anne Hardaway. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is the Shaq movie. It's like the first movie he was ever in. Um, basically made his Hollywood career. Yeah. Short-lived Hollywood career. <laughs> he kind of gave up being in movies pretty fast, I feel. Like, wasn't he in like a genie movie where he was the genie? That was kind of like the peak. 
Kazam. Millennials. Kazam. Yeah. Yep. Um, and uh, in this one, he's a basketball player, and so is Anthony Hardaway. And I think there's like a whole like point shaving controversy in the movie where like one of the characters is shaving points. I don't remember if it's Anthony Hardaway or Shaq or somebody else. I don't remember. Um, the movie is pretty bad, I would say in general. And because it leans on basketball players to do some of the heavy lifting, it's, (coughs) it's bad and it's acted bad, but it's kind of bad in like a mid (coughs) nineties basketball star charming kind of way. Um, (coughs) And so I enjoy it, but I will make no guarantees that other people will enjoy it. (coughs) Probably the most interesting thing about the movie is that it's directed by William Friedkin, which is amazing to me that he directed this movie because it is, you look at his filmography and you're like, how does this guy make this movie amongst all these other movies? Because it's like, cruising the exorcist you know like just movie after movie that is not a sport a bright sports movie um to live and die in la bug killer joe these are the movies he's known for and the one he's not known for is blue chips cool my number five is the absent-minded professor from 1961. Wow. This is the Disney original that Flubber was a remake of. <laughs> I would say, isn't the same movie? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Kyle, you'll like this. If you haven't seen it, it stars Fred McMurray. I do like Fred McMurray. Yep, me too. And uh, I like this better than Flubber. And it's the exact same story. Mm-hmm. Uh, professor invents... A mysterious goo that like helps them do a lot of things, and one of them is uh, win a basketball game. And this is a movie I saw several times as a kid, and I just thought it was super fun. The um, special effects of these basketball players jumping around is really funny. Like it, they're just like doing these gigantic jumps, and it's just very uh, fun to watch. Mm-hmm. And I like Fred McMurray, especially when he's playing an absent-minded kind of guy. You know, in the movie, he has to write a note that he's getting married that day. And he forgets, <laughs> like, he's just absent-minded. Um, but, yeah, these are just one of those live-action Disney films that are just fun to watch. And I liked it a lot. So, The Absent-Minded Professor from 1961, my number five. Does he use the flubber? to make a car fly or bounce yes. in this movie. Abs- no, it flies, absolutely. I may have seen this movie. Now that I think Great. about it. Yeah. Nice. I don't remember the basketball part whatsoever, but I do remember the flying car. Flying car. Yep. All right. My number 5 is Eddie. This is a 1996 Whoopi Goldberg movie. In this Whoopi Goldberg plays a uh loud sassy fan of the New York Knicks who wins a contest to be like coach for a day and is so popular that she has made um, the full-time coach of the basketball team, the Knicks, try and make them a winning team. And this is another movie that I had forgotten I had seen, but watched a trailer and for sure had seen this movie. I remember liking this movie. This is the other movie now that I can associate with basketball from the 90s. And I was just scrolling through the cast list, and this movie has a Donald Trump cameo in it. So if you're looking to complete your Donald Trump filmography, Eddie, add it to your list. All right. I am looking to complete my Donald Trump filmography, so I'll check it out. Uh, uh, my number- he has 218 credits on it. Um, absolutely <laughs> insane. Is that like every time he showed up in anything, What even if it's not him? You know what I mean? Well, yeah. So, so his his number one uh, starring role by popularity is Black Klansman. So, I'm sure it's like any time his image right. is used, archival footage type. Right. Of stuff. So, you have yeah. to find like actual roles, like Home Alone mm-hmm. two or something like that. Mm-hmm. All right, my number four is from 2020. It's a movie that I think is um, shamefully ignored, called The Way Back. You want to see a movie with Ben Affleck where he actually cares about being in the movie. 
watch The Way Back. Don't watch Air. He doesn't care about being in that movie. He cares about being in The Way Back. This is, um, I wish Matt Damon was in this movie because then it would be like a sequel to uh, Good Will Hunting. It's like that kind of movie, like an intense, well-acted, gripping story about a guy who is an alcoholic who um, is a basketball coach. And I forget why, but for some reason he has to coach a team. <laughs> I think probably very similar premise to champions where he like does something and then he's sentenced to coaching a team or something like that. Um, so anyway, he coaches a team and uh, he's very, he's a very complicated guy um, who has, who's an alcoholic. And so he has uh, an issue that he needs to deal with. And so, over the course of coaching the team, he figures out how to um, get help with his issue and um, and also finds his way back to the game in ways through this team. And um, yeah, it's just a really, really solid dramatic performance from Ben Affleck. If you miss kind of that version of Ben Affleck. This is the, this is the best I've seen in a long time for sure. Um, and I think it was generally ignored because it came out March 6th, 2020. And so it only had like a week in theaters before everybody stopped going to movie theaters cold. And then they kind of dumped it on digital video, like two weeks later. And by then people were just, too busy watching uh what was that guy on netflix the alligator oh, tiger guy? king tiger king everybody was watching tiger king they were not looking for ben affleck's basketball movie um and so it, i think it kind of fell by the wayside but um i think in a different year maybe not oscar nominated but i bet he could have won critics awards based on his performance in this movie it's also interesting too that he is a guy who has admitted to being an alcoholic in public and it kind of feels like an actor who is trying to get back to why he acts in an, in a weird way. Like the story is of a coach who's like, why do I even care about this game anymore? And it, it gave me like this weird meta feeling where it was almost like Ben Affleck saying through the screen to me, why do I care about acting anymore? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I've hit, I've done everything there is to do. Um, and yet I have a similar problem to this character I'm playing. So in order to love doing this again, I need to figure out why. Um, and uh, I don't know if that was intentional, but that's the vibe I got from the movie and his performance. And um, I, I rate it highly, even if you don't like basketball, if you just like dramatic movies, or you like Ben Affleck being dramatic, check out The Way Back. Yeah, it's one I haven't uh, caught up with yet, but sounds interesting. Yeah. Sounds interesting. Uh, my number four is my only documentary on the list. It is the best basketball documentary in uh, a m- movie World. format. <laughs> uh, and that is called Hoop Dreams. And Hoop Dreams follows uh, two inner city kids on their journey to try to become college basketball players in the hopes of becoming NBA players. And uh, yeah, you just learn so much about these kids and the struggles that they have in order to play basketball and try to get to that next level. And it's just, it's super, super good. Um also, the IMDb trivia for this movie has an interesting tidbit. Uh, according to Roger Ebert, after the film failed to receive an Oscar nomination for Best Documentary, he and Gene Sisko learned about the nominating process. He said that members of the Academy's documentary committee held flashlights when they watched documentaries, and anyone who had given up could wave it against the screen, and the movie would be turned off if a majority waved their flashlights. And this film was turned off after 15 minutes. Really? So that seems just ridiculous that that's how they do that, or at least did that back then. But yeah. Yeah, especially since this ended up winning the Academy Award, right? Like it's a. No, it wasn't nominated. Oh, it was not nominated. Hmm. Interesting. Because this committee that handles the nominations 
didn't nominate it. The Flashlight okay. Committee. Yeah. Hoop Dreams, directed by the same guy who made Stevie, which I think is a documentary I've recommended to you, Zach, like a hundred times. <laughs> he followed up Hoop Dreams with Stevie. Never heard of it. You've never heard of it? <laughs> no, I'm trying I to dare think you. <laughs> My um, number four yeah. is the previously mentioned Uncut Gems, directed by the Safdie brothers, <laughs> starring Adam Sandler. And yeah, in this movie, he plays a uh, jewel broker who makes a series of increasingly high stakes bets throughout the movie, trying to keep ahead of um, the previous bet he made. And this all hinges around a pivotal basketball game at the very end. Uh, this movie is very anxiety inducing, but a uh, great performance from Sandler and a great uh, movie from the Safety brothers. I like that movie. It's not going to make my list just because it's not basketball enough for me, but great movie for fair. My number three, speaking of movies that probably aren't basketball enough, Teen Wolf. <laughs> from <Yeah>. 1985 <laughs> um i mean to me when i think of this movie i think of basketball but it's only because i was way into basketball like in the mid 80s to like the mid 90s basically because my dad loved basketball and so i love basketball because he watched it constantly um and i liked michael jordan and that was like you know his heyday from the late 80s to mid 90s and um teen wolf there's like a basketball is woven through it like the main character played by michael j fox is on the basketball team and he's not very good neither is anybody on his team they're all not very good and so when he figures out that he can turn into a werewolf at one point in the game somebody um makes him angry and much like the hulk when he gets angry he turns into the wolf and that's like the point in the movie where everybody finds out that he is teen wolf and so it had a big impression on me um, and it happens to be a basketball scene. And then of course he slam dunks as a, as a wolf for, because wolves do that evidently. I don't know. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a big part of the movie. And, um, and I like teen wolf. So it's my number three, probably for nostalgic reasons, more than quality reasons. I imagine. Cool. My number three is Hoosiers, the aforementioned Hoosiers from 1986, uh, starring Gene Hackman. And I think this is like one of the like quintessential basketball films. Mm -hmm. Like when I think of basketball films, this is probably the first thing that comes to mind. And it just, you know, have it, you have this coach coming into this racist town and he has to win a championship. And I liked it. I think if you like basketball movies, you got to see Hoosiers. Was that a part of the story that I don't remember that like he wanted to have like black players on the team in order to win or something like that? Was that part of it? I don't remember. I don't think so. No, okay. I, I there's possibly I could be conflating it with uh, remember the Titans. <laughs> they which, feel like very which similar football, not me. basketball. <laughs> no, exactly. It's the football version of Hoosiers. Pretty much. Sure. Yeah. Kyle. All right. My number three is a 1994 movie called a Above the Rim. This is about a basketball player in um, high school who has a scholarship to go play for college. I think this takes place in like Compton or a rough neighborhood in L.A. And this is kind of his ticket out. Um, but he is enticed to instead stick around and play um, sort of like local tournaments coached by a team uh, by Tupac, by a drug dealer played by Tupac. And so it's about this um, kid kind of struggling between, do I get out of my situation and go play college or do I get tempted by playing basketball for this drug dealer and get cars and money and all this um, short-term fame? Mm -hmm. And this is a movie that I actually encountered first in middle school because of the soundtrack. And the Above the Rib soundtrack had regulates by Nate Dogg and Warren G. Mm -hmm. And for people who were not born um, in the 20th century, mm -hmm. if you wanted to hear a song, you had to buy the CD. <laughs> you could wait so, for it to play on the radio. but Or, or, or MTV. Well, I, I wasn't right. listening to radio that played 
regulates. So it was mm-hmm. either MTV or in this case, buying the above the rim soundtrack just to hear regulate because that song is awesome. And the rest of the soundtrack is pretty good. I finally got around to seeing Above the Rim a couple of years ago because I was like, well, I know so much about this movie just from the soundtrack. I should actually see it. And I was waiting all movie for there to be a needle drop of Regulate. And it never happened. It's not even in the credits. It might have been on the credits, but I was waiting okay. for it to happen like in the movie. Like sure. I, I was I was hoping there'd be like a basketball game, like maybe the high six basketball game, high stakes basketball game would be played to Regulate. Of like, you know, the the back and forth. No, <laughs> missed moment, but at least it was on the end credits. So I got mm. to get that uh that that joy filled. Nice. So my yeah, never- shout out to all my friends in middle school for listening to Above the Rim soundtrack. I don't know, Zach, did I subjugate subjugate you to that at all? I don't remember. No. no. Okay. I m- I must have been like, you know what? Zach doesn't care for this hippity hoppity. We're gonna <laughs> not play that for him. My number two is from 1992. It's White Men Can't Jump. And um, this is my th- the first rated R movie I saw in a movie theater. I had certainly seen rated R movies at home, like on video rental and on HBO. But um, this is the first one I went to a theater to watch. And I remember getting my sister, my oldest sister to take me and my little sister to White Men Can't Jump. And we got there and she's like, about to buy the ticket she's like this is r-rated i don't think mom wants me to take you to this and i was like it's just language it's, it's not a big deal they're they're gonna curse a couple times it's not a big deal you could take you can take us you could take us i like badgered her and she took us and it's cursing I mean, there's a <laughs> lot of cursing and white men can't jump it's like every other word for sure and it's a lot of rosie perez naked in that movie and uh, beating people, beating each other up, and um, it's a rated R movie for a reason, more than just cursing. But um, so yeah, uh, I respect my sister for letting us stay in the movie and watch the whole thing. But I'm pretty sure my little sister was way too young <laughs> to watch that movie in a movie theater. In 1992, I would have been 13, and my little sister would have been six or seven. Oh my goodness yeah <laughs> so luckily she was like young enough that i've talked to her about this and she just doesn't really have a memory about it like it didn't wasn't a big deal to her enough to like make an imprint uh but it made an imprint on me and also i've seen the movie since then and i think it holds up as like a, a good con man on the streets basketball movie um that definitely feels like a early to mid 90s movie uh but I enjoy it. My number two. Nice. My number two, it's a movie we talked about last week. It's not a basketball movie, but it has basketball in it. American History X. Um, Include it because it's a movie that I liked quite a bit. And I do have, I remember the basketball scenes pretty vividly. So I included it. I consider this movie, but I left it off just because I talked about it last week. Yeah. I was trying to think about what episode I missed where we discussed American History X. What list was Did, that? Brothers. Brothers. Okay. Right. Yeah. 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 We um, didn't mention it. Yep, we did. Okay. My number two is not American History X. Instead, it's another very serious special movie called Basketball. I can't believe we talked about Super Mario Brothers and American History X on the same episode. <laughs> in, in, in the same <laughs> list. <laughs> I think that's what's throwing me off. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sure. Go ahead, Kyle. What were you saying? <laughs> so, uh, basketball is my yes. number two. Previously mentioned, yes. Yep. Uh, Trey Parker, Matt Stone. I was surprised that they did not they did not write this movie. It seemed like something they would have created. Yeah. Instead, they just were in it back when maybe people thought, "Hey, these guys might be in movies." Mm-hmm. Um, then the whole South Park thing took off, and they obviously don't need to be doing that anymore. Uh, and this movie is it's silly, it's stupid. Um, but I watched it a lot in college. It came out in 98. I started college in 2001. DVDs are just coming out. So everyone had this on DVD. It was just the perfect storm of here's a movie we can all watch on a weekend. And mm. I have a soft spot for the stupid humor of basketball. I enjoyed it as well. My number one, my 
currently my favorite basketball movie. It's early days for this movie. It might be a little rash to put it at a number one, but I'm running with it because uh, I was pretty high on this movie from 2022. Hustle. This movie's on Netflix. Stars Adam Sandler being serious in the movie. He plays a recruiter who um, just can't catch a break. Like everybody he recruits, like either gets signed and then immediately gets injured or doesn't work out for some reason. He's been on like a really bad streak and he goes to South America or rather is sent to South America, which is where they send the bad basketball scouts, international basketball scouts, because who are you going to find in South America is like the attitude that the movie is giving you. And so he goes to South America and just finds a guy playing pickup ball on a playground and is like, you could actually play in the NBA. So the rest of the movie is him trying to convince people in the United States to bring him over and um, give him an NBA contract. And you can really feel the love in this movie that Adam Sandler has for basketball. (laughs) Like he loves, he unashamedly loves basketball in his real life. He plays basketball to this day. He hosts like basketball games and charity basketball games and walks around in basketball shorts. Even when he doesn't have to, he, it's like his uniform, basically t-shirts and basketball shorts. And, um, you can feel it in this, uh, in this movie. And, um, if you want like a less intense version of uncut gems, this is your movie for okay. sure. And the guy who plays, um, the, uh, the basketball player that's being recruited. Um, he's great in it. He's like a basketball, he's like a pro European player. Um, and so he can actually play basketball and they seem to unlike blue chips, be able to write a script where even if somebody can't act that you're giving them realistic things to do and like perform. And so it felt natural. It didn't feel Um, out of place like it felt like he was a good actor and then you take a step back and you think well I don't know if he's really good it's just they didn't put him in any situations that he couldn't win (laughs) type of thing and so um, yeah I just really enjoyed it It has a lot to do with basketball and the business of basketball Um, and uh, and I like serious uh, Adam Sandler every now and then he's really good in this one my number one cool uh, my number one is a movie I'm a big fan of, and uh, it only has 1.4, it only has 1,400 ratings on IMDb. Wow, so 1,400 people on IMDb have seen it. Uh, it's called I've talked about it on the show before, it's called The Pistol, The Birth of a Legend, and this is the story of Pistol Pete. Um, a boy, probably like middle school age, uh, who's just really, really good at basketball. Um, he's incredibly good, especially at ball handling. And uh, it's the story of him and his father. And uh, I, this movie, I just find incredibly charming and likable. And I really like Pistol Pete. And I really like his father. I think it's my favorite father depiction in a movie. And, uh, yeah, so I enjoy this movie quite a bit and I have no idea where you can actually see it, but, uh, it's called the pistol from 1991. That this movie actually came out on Blu-ray. Did it really? That's fun. 2013. Very cool. Hmm. Well, Zach, you can find it on Blu-ray. Complex named it the 19th best basketball movie of all time. <laughs> Not bad. Out of 20? No, this is a know. good movie. Awesome. Well, that was our... Uh, no, wait. Kyle has another one. What? No, it's fine. We, we can skip it. Kyle has one more movie for us. <laughs> <laughs> my number one is the movie of the week, Air. This fits all of my criteria for this list. Uh, James, you're talking about hustle, and this actually reminded me of a scene at the very beginning of Air that I forgot mm-hmm. to mention, where Matt Damon is at like a high school basketball game. He kind of like talking up some players and say, "Hey, nice jump shot! Don't forget Nike!" and kind of walks away. And that scene totally reminded me of this Mr. Show sketch 
where Bob and David are playing basketball recruiters for two tiny colleges in like Indiana. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're like going to like middle school basketball courts and like trying to talk up kids again to sign on to like their college in 10 years. <laughs> and just, just kind of like, like that whole sad sack routine of like, hey, don't forget Nike. Just reminded me of that whole Mr. Show sketch. So sure. I try and envision my whole world through how can I relate them to a Mr. Show sketch. <laughs> and this okay. one fit in perfectly for me. Nice. Sure. Awesome. Um, cool. Well, that was our top 10 basketball movies. Hope you enjoyed that. If there's any we missed, uh, let us know. This last week, I also watched um, Love and Basketball and Above the Rim for the first time. What did you think of I, Above I, the Rim? I enjoyed both of those. Yeah. Above the Rim is pretty 90s. Oh, yeah. Say. Like, <laughs> it's... <laughs> It's a weird, like, high-stakes gang movie that's also a basketball movie. (laughs) Right, and it ends with, like, Tupac telling somebody to shoot somebody on the basketball court right after they won the championship type of thing. And then it ends in, like, a slow-motion gunshot (laughs) scene. Um, Yeah, it was was fun to watch, though. Love and Basketball was fine, too. Um, Not sure it did much for me, but I wasn't mad at it. Anyway, um, thank you for listening. We appreciate your listenership. Uh, don't forget, you can always send us an email to heyguys at cinerealist.com. Send us a comment, a question, a list suggestion, a movie suggestion, any of those kinds of things. Let us know if uh, we didn't even mention your fa- favorite basketball movie. It's possible we haven't seen it. There was like a decent amount on that list that I had not seen. Um, I think I've seen most of the majors, but maybe there's some hidden gems out there that I I don't think I go too deep into this world. So, um, yeah, send us your list of favorite basketball movies, or you could, um, you could follow us on YouTube, subscribe to the channel, watch while you listen. You could leave us a Apple podcast review, or you could follow us on social media at Cinerealist on TikTok, Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. You could also follow me on my personal Letterboxd or Twitter account at YoJRB. You can follow me on Twitter or Letterboxd at Shobin. You can find me on Letterboxd at Peter SKB. Next week, uh, we're not quite sure what we're going to do next week. We don't know what movie we're going to do. We know what we're not going to do. But I'm forgetting what we're not going to do. We're not going to do Bo is Not Afraid. Right. That's been pushed out a week. That's pushed out a week. Right. Right. right, right. We're not doing, we're going to do Bo is Not Afraid. Just not next week. Two weeks from now, we're going to do Bo is Not Afraid. Next week, we still don't know what we're going to do. What I'm saying, Kyle and Zach, is next week, we don't know what we're going to do. But the week after, we know. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I think oh, people yeah. have picked up on that. We know. <laughs> All right. <laughs> just want to see how long I can take this. Explaining the same thing yeah. over and over yeah. again. You guys like to rag on how I start the show, but man, the ending of these shows just <laughs> goes on. <laughs> I just want to see how long people will listen to nonsense <laughs> where I explain the same thing over and over. Uh, thanks for listening, guys. We appreciate it. We'll see you next time. Until then, keep it real. It's over. Go home.
kau